Hey. Oh. No. Hi. Hope everyone is uh, doing their best to stay healthy. It'll get back to normal eventually. I don't know when. Sure is taking its time though. Yeah, I switched the lamp to this side um, because this big guy was uh, right in front of my window right there. And I felt like it was kind of blocking some light. Uh, so I swapped them. Hopefully it's a good change. This is going to be another one of those episodes where I, I talk about like five random records from my collection. Gotten a few more since the last one. Uh, so I have them in here. And then I have like a little cabinet down there where I keep all my all my favorites. And if you can guess which records from this episode came from my secret favorite cabinet down here, I will reward you with a virtual gold star. I'll give you a hint. There's two in this episode. If you didn't see my last episode like this, I had a random number generator select random albums from my collection, and I have tasked myself with giving a brief description of each album and then sort of recommending it. A couple housekeeping items as well. In the first episode I did of this, I erroneously said that White Houses was on Vanessa Carlton's debut album. Uh, it turns out it's actually on her second album, so that's my bad. Hopefully uh, she wasn't watching that video because I'm, I'm worried that I might have um, blown my, my only shot. Also, a good friend of mine pointed out in my Flying Lotus video for You're Dead, um, I said Thundercat was a frequent Flying Lotus collaborator, but I didn't make a frequent flyer pun. Um, and I, I do regret that, and I'm really sorry about that as well. Here are some random records from my collection. <coughs> First up is Master of Reality by Black Sabbath. Uh, I really love this album. It's one of my favorite metal albums, which I know is kind of basic, a little obvious, but I'm not like a huge metalhead. And to be fair, it is a very solid metal album. Black Sabbath is a really interesting band to me. So I'm into like 60s pop and rock music. And I feel like Black Sabbath is like the antithesis of like the, the happy-go-lucky like sunshine pop. They sort of like came out of nowhere. I mean, they didn't like come out of nowhere. Like obviously they got influences from like heavy psych and like hard rock from the, the 60s. Still, they kind of popped up like right as the 60s ended with some of the edgiest, the hardest music that anyone had, had ever heard. And despite their overtly occult image and uh, references, like especially in their debut album, which is also called Black Sabbath. Not a very subtle name, of course. You know what you're getting into uh, with a name like that. Despite all the occult stuff, uh, they still managed to be fairly popular. I mean, now they're at like sporting event bumper music status, which is like the highest echelon of, of pop culture exposure, which I think is pretty funny for, for a band like Black Sabbath. I love kind of the classic horror font they use for this cover. There's nothing too complex going on with this album cover, but uh, I, I think it does the trick. Not really any duds on the track list. Sweet Leaf is a, is a really good opener, one of my favorite Black Sabbath songs. I feel like Lord of This World, which opens up Side 2 is a kind of an underrated Black Sabbath song. I don't hear it brought up in conversations as often as I think it should be. I guess Lord of This World doesn't open up Side 2. There's like a classically influenced uh, little uh, interlude that opens up Side 2, along with... Uh, there, there are a couple interludes on here to kind of break up the break up the track list. The guitar riffage on this album is really doomy and soul-sucking, but also like there are tracks on here that are really upbeat and energetic, and it never really goes so hard that it's like off-putting. It still manages to be pretty pretty accessible for a metal album. Black Sabbath was like really good at, at towing that line. Some really good rock drumming as well from Bill Ward. Here's the gatefold if you haven't seen it. Pretty cool. Yeah so obviously if you're into metal music or hard rock music uh, you've probably heard this album. Uh, you've definitely heard Black Sabbath but if you haven't heard this album I would definitely give it a listen. I think it's accessible enough that most people can enjoy this. Really a top tier early metal album. Next is Discipline by King Crimson. This one has no gatefold. Uh, I'm a fan of this album for sure. Definitely a fan of King Crimson. I maybe don't love this album as much as some other hardcore King Crimson fans do but I do find it very enjoyable. So for this album, Robert Fripp, who is the band leader of King Crimson, uh, basically inserts his experimental guitar playing techniques and his experimental production techniques into a kind of an 80s new wave template. Definitely getting some Talking Heads vibes from this album, and that's not really a coincidence. So Adrian Ballou played guitar and did vocals on this album. He also played guitar with Talking Heads when they were recording remain in light. So there's some crossover. This album has an all-star lineup. I mean, you got Robert Fripp, obviously, and Adrian Ballou. Tony Levin on bass. He's an excellent bassist. Very recognizable person. I've seen him twice in concert, and he he steals the show, basically. He's always a, a, a sight to behold. <laughs> he's on here credited with playing the stick 
which uh, refers to a Chapman stick. If you're not familiar with a Chapman stick, it's a it's a bass guitar that you're meant to tap really quickly. Definitely has a solid place in prog. And Bill Bruford on drums, he played with Yes, one of my favorite prog bands. As far as the track list goes, Elephant Talk uh, is a really cool song. Frame by Frame, another cool song. And Discipline goes super hard. <laughs> Thalo Hoon Jinjeet is a banger. I could go on, I could list every track on this album. Um, they're all pretty good. I guess maybe The Sheltering Sky on side two um, is a little aimless, but it's it's still an enjoyable listen. It still sounds pretty cool. But yeah, King Crimson is like one of the most sonically diverse bands of all time. Even calling them a band is a little bit questionable since really it's just Robert Fripp and whichever collection of musicians he feels like working with at the time. I wouldn't want to compare this to like their 60s and 70s output, which was decidedly more rock oriented, whereas this album is sort of like the starting point of a, of a new wave phase for Robert Fripp. But yeah, really cool album. I'd recommend it to anyone who is into new wave and who doesn't mind a healthy dose of instrumental virtuosity. Oh cool, I get to talk about Foxtails. <laughs> so this is an album by the band Foxtails. It's called Kirida Hiha, which I almost certainly did not pronounce correctly. They're a, they're a really cool, kind of lesser known emo group. This is their most recent album, released in 2019. I was really excited for this release. I was definitely quick to pre-order this so I could get it on vinyl. I've been keeping track of them since 2017 when they released their album called Three. And I really dug that one. Really cool, dark, twinkly guitars. They're pretty solid drumming. Uh, but the most notable aspect of the band, uh, and this continues on to this album, is the vocalist, who can seemingly go from floaty, clean vocals to like straight up shouting to um, blood curdling screams at the drop of a hat. There's a lot of, of vocal diversity on here. Very, very visceral screaming. Uh, almost painful screaming on this album. It is quite a trip. <laughs> Definitely check this album out if you're into the whole indie emo screamo scene. This is a very solid album. Um, a little, a little short. It's like 25 minutes or so. I look forward to future releases from this group for sure. Um, um, uh, so this, hmm, this is an album by The Residents called Third Reich and Roll. Okay, um, how do I, essentially this is a, a, an album, it's like a medley of covers of 60s pop songs. And I don't know if it's obvious from the title or from the really obnoxious cover art, but it's not really as simple as that. So this album art has been censored to hide all of the tongue-in-cheek Nazi imagery. All right, so who the f are the residents? <laughs> the residents are a very strange group, very experimental, very creepy. A lot of times they're a little too off-putting for, for my interests, but there is something about them that keeps me attracted to them in, in some, some weird primal sense of curiosity, I guess. Honestly, they have some of the weirdest, creepiest music I've I have ever heard. And they've been around forever. I think they formed like in the late 60s um, and they've been releasing albums pretty consistently since then. One of the main residents died recently, Hardy Fox. I'm not 100% sure on the status of their release schedule now, but yeah, they've been releasing music like crazy. <laughs> like look up their discography. They have so many records. It's so intimidating. I guess if you're gonna start somewhere with the residents, I start with Third Reich and Roll. <laughs> so for this album, they took a bunch of mega hits from the 60s and they twisted and warped them into something truly unsettling. Seriously, it's like a fever dream. I can't really describe what's going on in this album very well. This is an audio post from the late 70s. The vocals uh, <laughs> are like really squawky and atonal. The instrumental components, they're not really performed well. Uh, they don't really line up with each other. Although I will say their use of electronics and tape manipulation is pretty impressive considering when this album was released. Yeah, I'm not really going to recommend this to uh, the, fa the faint of heart. It's, it's not that bad. It's really not that bad. If you're into like 60s pop and have a really weird, creepy sense of humor, give this a shot. If you're into experimental music, you're probably already aware of The Residents and this album. If you haven't heard this album, I would be really curious to hear your thoughts. All right, guys, so I'm, I'm recording this shortly after Easter. And you know what that means. Christmas is right around the corner. So it's so appropriate that I'm talking about the Beach Boys Christmas album. I'm a huge fan of the Beach Boys. Um, their career arc is one of the most interesting pop culture tragedies of all time. That's for another video. There's a lot to dissect there. If I start going into all that Mike Love bull... Um, if I go into all of those business decisions, uh, I'm going to be here for a while. I'm not really prepared for that. And it would probably come off as... Uh, incoherent rambling, and I don't want to put you through that. You know, honestly, I shouldn't bash Mike Love that much. I, I know that he's a verifiable jerk, and he's done a number on, on the Beach Boys name. <laughs> but I feel like if it wasn't for his, like, stick to the formula mentality, um, I don't know if the Beach Boys would have seen the crazy amount of early success that they that they did. Speaking of formulas, 
Christmas albums. Look at those boys. <laughs> you know, I'm just now realizing that this album cover kind of reminds me of the Pet Sounds, where they're all kind of like confusingly doing some mundane task. Hang on. I mean, you be the judge. Do the Beach Boys look less comfortable putting up a Christmas tree or feeding petting zoo animals? Anyway, speaking of formulas, Christmas albums. Now, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of good Christmas albums from beloved pop artists, but normally Christmas albums are kind of like a, a cop-out, kind of like a cash-in. You know, it's like, it's like pop artists kind of reciting American standards that everyone's heard a thousand times before. It's a really safe bet. Usually there's not even a spin put on the songs. It's just like kind of brainless covers of, of these Christmas songs. And I suppose the Beach Boys, I mean, the spin that the Beach Boys put on these Christmas standards is their vocal arrangements, which are good in classic Beach Boys fashion. And there are some originals on here. It's not just covers. And there's some pretty good orchestral accompaniment. Brian Wilson didn't arrange the orchestra on this album, but it still sounds really good. Sounds very appropriate, very festive. I mean, all things considered, it's it's a solid Christmas album. You know, the performances are good. The Beach Boys are, are super inoffensive, very accessible. You can play this in, in any supermarket on the planet and people won't be bothered. It does help that I'm a big fan of the Beach Boys though, I will admit that. Maybe save this one till December, but if you haven't heard it, and you're into Christmas music, I mean, just, just give it a listen. I mean, put it on now. It might as well be Christmas time. So those are another five records from my collection. Hope you enjoyed this selection. Pretty good variety. Like I said, I got a bunch of these records. Uh, we will go through all of them. Problem is I keep getting more. I think it's doing me good. I, it, it really feels good to listen to records that I haven't listened to in a while. I like, I like going through my records and listening to them through kind of a different lens. Not just like passively listening to them, but like listening to them with an intent of recommending them. Anyway, uh, like I said, I hope you guys are doing your best to stay healthy. Hope you guys are kind of handling this situation as well as you can be, hopefully better than I am. <laughs> you know, I've noticed my energy levels have been low lately. Uh, that's because I'm not getting outside as often as I as I usually do. Um, so I've been making an effort to like go out on walks and stuff and that's that's been benefiting me. So I guess that's my, my big recommendation for you guys is to go for a walk, you know? Soak up the sun. Soak up the Beach Boys Christmas sun. All right. Um. <laughs>